Turning back on the mountain is the toughest decision ever. When you declare your mission plans, it is assumed you will summit. What is your limit? In a climber's journey, mountains teach us the art of perseverance. Never give up. Yet, imagine being just a few hundred meters from the top, feeling that you're not gonna summit. The chain of events acting like a domino effect, leading to that crucial point of a turnaround decision. Despite the breathtaking beauty, the tireless efforts and the cost invested. Thus, missing a summit make you a loser. What is the summit anyway? Is it a dot on a map, a trick point, or does it shift to your personal limit on that particular day? There is a profound psychology behind every climber's decision. Summiting a mountain, it's not just a physical ascent, it's a journey within you. Today, we are sharing those factors that may lead you to failing on Mount Aspiring. A lot of people are asking why New Zealand weather is so unsettled. Let's have a look at the forecast now. So here we are on Saturday. New Zealand is like two big islands full of mountains and the weather here loves to surprise us all the time. It's because New Zealand is right in the middle of powerful winds from the Southern Ocean and the Tropical Pacific. So our weather is always up for a change and that's something every Kiwi adventurer knows well. 60 to 80 millimeters of rain and most of that is falling this weekend. Happy New Year to you. Sitting in Wanaka's cozy waterfront cafe, sipping on our morning coffee and munching a classic almond croissant, a wave of disappointment hit us. The week's forecast didn't look promising. Rain, more rain, a brief appearance of partial clouds, and then, you guessed it. Ten days of rain. The catch? Fixed the dates for our Christmas break. No flexibility to dodge the gloomy weather. We were there, stuck with the forecast, faced with the ultimate question. Attempt or not to attempt? The die is cast. We are in. In our mountain adventures, we realized the importance of keeping tabs on local climbing communities on Facebook for vital updates on mountain conditions. It would have been beneficial to have the recent beta on the snowpack status, insights into the approach and the evolving conditions of the Bona Glacier before setting out. However, information is often scattered, requiring careful screening. Recognizing the need for a centralized platform, a year later we came across mountainjourneys.co.nz established by New Zealand guide and mountaineer Rob Frost. Sharing observations on this platform could simplify mountain life for everyone. And yes, if that page had been established by then, it would have saved us troubles up on the mountain. Climbing Aspiring is considered best from November to January and mid-December seemed just right for our ascent. While following the Facebook climbing group, we stumbled across a conversation that would significantly shape our upcoming adventure. This discussion was a blend of hope, disappointment, concerns about unpredictable weather, money invested in the heli ride, challenging winds, and plans to climb the southwest ridge of Mount Aspiring in the next few days. Little did we know that this conversation would directly influence our experience a few days later. There are two main ways of getting to Kolentot Hut, the base of Mount Aspari. Most climbers prefer the French ridge route via Quarterdeck Pass and across Bona Glacier, especially in the early season. It offers the advantage of breaking the challenging ascent with a night's rest at French Ridge Hut. The shifting glacial slope quickly forms extensive crevasses on the ascent to the pass, especially from mid to late December, depending on the year. The crucial question is, are the snow bridges still safe this year? Do we trust the more convenient water deck for Christmas? Or do we opt for the alternative Bivan Col route, requiring a bivouac halfway to Colin Todd, hence the need for carrying a tent and more sleeping gear? On the flip side, the Bivan Col route is frequently recommended as the primary access to Colin Todd Hut. However, it includes navigating rock slabs about the waterfall at the end of the West Matukituki Valley, which is better avoided in the rain unless you're confident. The Bivangol route is usually chosen after the end of December, so we decided on the French Ridge and Quarter Deck Pass instead. As they say, there are only two types of mountaineers – bold climbers and old climbers. 
It would have been wise to assume that the quarterdeck pass might be cut off for the year, but we turned a blind eye and hoped to find out more from a warden at Aspiring Hut. The initial part of the approach follows the Aspiring Station Road, which you can also bike, leaving your gear at Aspiring Hut. As we neared the hut, we spotted three climbers in the distance. It turned out to be a party that was forced over the mountain a week prior, as we had read in a Facebook post in the NZ Climbing Group. These Australian guys had flown in by helicopter to climb the southwest ridge, but turned around due to weather conditions. On their way back, they discovered that the quarterdeck pass was already cut off and impassable. Filled with regret and disappointment, they returned to Wanaka. After resetting their minds, they waited for a weather window, ascended via Bivan Cole, climbed the mountain, and descended in a storm, soaking wet. With this new knowledge, we were puzzled. We knew nothing about the Bivan Cole route, didn't have bivak gear to slip halfway at the upper of West Matukituki, and the storm was forecasted for the next day. Feeling discouraged, it seemed unlikely that we would reach Colin Todd Hut anytime soon. Aspiring hut was still under renovation, so sleeping there wasn't an option. It was 11 a.m. when Vitaly decided to run back to the Raspberry Creek car park to get a tent from our car, which we carelessly left there. At 2 p.m., we were back on the track towards Bivan Call. We knew it was going to be a long day. We camped near the end of the valley, setting up our tent on a small flat spot near a stream. The total distance to Colin Todd Hut is around 28 kilometers with a significant elevation gain, making it awfully tiring. While guided parties often opt for a chopper ride to Bivan Hall and a walk across the Bona Glacier to the hut, we believe that walking in at least the first time is a must. Flying in has its benefits, such as maximizing a weather window and increasing the walking to climbing ratio, but we prefer the spiritual and emotional connection to the land that walking in provides. Despite the exhaustion, we don't look for easy solutions. As we ascended the waterfall slabs and approached Hector Call, the weather took a sharp turn for the worse. A two-person party catching up with us at the waterfall wisely decided to turn back, feeling ill-equipped for the deteriorating weather. However, we, not ready to concede so easily, hoped for the best. This was the moment of truth. The wise choice would have been to turn around, rappel down the wet rock slabs and walk back to the car park despite getting soaking wet. However, the prospect of dealing with disappointment and regret later wasn't something we were prepared for, so we foolishly played the bold climber's card. I am not sure if it was objectively hazardous or if we just weren't mentally prepared, but the next five hours were spent battling wind, rain and a complete white out on Bona Glacier. Our advanced map reading skills and navigation using a GPS app came in handy. By the time we reached the hut, utterly exhausted, freezingly cold and completely soaked, the initial positive inspiration had vanished, and all we wanted was to descend the mountain back to the car park. Only those who have experienced such unpleasant weather conditions can truly understand the mental and physical suffering it entails. The following day was spent weathering the storm in the hut, working on restoring our mood while pondering the possibility of a weather window to aim for the summit. Apart from New Zealand's famously unpredictable weather, the lack of internet connection made it impossible to predict the conditions for the days ahead. While evening radio sessions with the aspiring hut could potentially address the issue, Hut wardens, who are mainly there for trampers and day walkers, often lack sufficient knowledge or even a proper forecast for the high altitude areas. Our only source of information were old, outdated weather screenshots from the Mountain Forecast website. Drying wet gear in a hut isn't the easiest task. With the temperature hovering near zero degrees outside, the most effective way to dry your clothes is to bring them inside your sleeping bag. Fortunately, our belay jackets and sleeping bags survived the wet storm as we packed them into waterproof dry bags. Wow. 
finally. The new day emerged, bringing a slow end to the storm. The sun became our savior, helping to dry out wet mountaineering boots. Okay, so here we are. We are drying up, drying our shoes. And let's see if tomorrow will be a successful day for us to conquer Mount Aspiring. However, with the sun came a new challenge – wet slip avalanches. The freezing level around 32,000 meters and the soaked snow slopes of Mount Aspiring created a risky situation. As we observed the kangaroo patch, our planned ascent route, we began to feel it might not be such a good idea. Around 5 p.m. the worst happened. The upper part of the kangaroo patch unleashed a massive roaring avalanche. To push for the summit, we would have to tackle the full northwest rocky ridge traverse, a time-consuming endeavor that will require us a rope at certain points. We knew that reaching the summit wasn't guaranteed. In fact, at that time the odds were mostly against us due to reasons beyond our control. It simply felt that by that time we were not in the best shape for the climb. The alarm went off at 2 a.m. and so began our summit day. The usual routine of dressing up, making breakfast, checking the bags, it was slow. Off the hut in the dark, walking up the Shipona Ridge and eventually seeing the impressive northwest ridge in full length. Climbing up around the corner of the ridge onto the side of Thermo Glacier was an interesting experience as we didn't really know if we should traverse the corner rock gendarmes or simply rappel down to the glacier and try navigating through it. I wish we could bypass that step by walking up onto the ISO glacier, but on the other hand we would have to deal with passing the Bershrunk trying to get up on the ridge later. Northwest ridge of Mount Star. The progress was so slow that by 9 a.m. we barely made it to the foot of the buttress. So we made it to the buttress. People normally walk up here, but the freezing level was so terrible today. The snow doesn't hold anything, so we decided to go traverse the lower section. It took us two more hours, but we are here now at the buttress and we are going to climb it. One thing was obvious, the difficulties and exhaustion of the approach drained our mental and physical reserves that were so needed for the main summit push. We slowly continued pushing forward, but the heat of the sun reflected by the snow and rock around was slowly finishing us. It was an abnormally hot year, with all the snow ledges bypassing the big rock step of the buttress gone by then. At the top of the buttress, right on the ridge, around 2400 meters, a clear picture came up. It simply wasn't our day to climb Mount Aspiring. That was it. A turnaround point. The most common thought about reaching the summit is once you are there, you arrived. In fact, you are only halfway. You still have to get back down and after a tough climb to the top, this is always the hardest part. Decided to turn back, unfortunately. It's too late in the day. The day is really hot. It was raining for two days before, and the snow is really slashing. So we did the full reach from Colinton Hut. Obviously, it took us longer. We couldn't take any shortcuts anywhere, so we were just scrambling along and sometimes pitching. Long story short, Mount Aspiring behind me next time, unfortunately. Was it difficult to turn back? Surprisingly, no. If you had asked me before I had to turn back, I would have said I couldn't imagine doing it. I think I would have probably felt as if I had failed and it would have been awful. There are two main questions worth thinking about. Are you prepared to turn back? And do you know when to turn back? <laughs>
every climber should be prepared to do so, realizing that reaching the top isn't everything. Physically, mentally and emotionally, where are your limits? We think that having turnaround time helps skipping us safe, but nothing beats experience to understand your limits and yourself. These lessons learned on Mount Aspiring were absolutely valuable when we climb again, but also in life in general. It's a bit of a cliche, but it's most definitely about the journey, not all about the destination.